Good afternoon and welcome to Emory University's Goizueta Business School. Today we're going to be talking about becoming a dyna dynamic leader with our uh, Goizueta MBA. Uh, I'm joined today by Professor Peter Topping and two of our current MBA students. I'll have them introduce themselves shortly, but first I'm going to do just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we do want this to be an interactive chat, so please uh, ask questions at any time. We'll do our best to answer them on air. Uh, many of you have already submitted questions when you registered, so thank you for that. We're going to go ahead and kick off with some of those. Um, uh, also note that we are recording this web chat in its entirety, so if you miss anything, uh, don't worry. We will send you the entire recording after the chat within about a week, uh, along with any slides that we share uh, today. Um, so to start, we'll get this uh, kicked off, and I'll have Dr. Topping introduce himself. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to all out there and your uh, tuning in and your interest in Goswetta Business School. I'm a faculty member in the Organization and Management Group, and I teach courses in leadership across all the MBA program formats. Will? Sure. I'm uh, Will Swafford. I'm a uh, one-year student in the uh, MBA program here, and uh, currently I'm an active duty Army officer through the uh, Army uh, graduate program. I'm Ashley Freeman. I'm an evening MBA student in the class of 2018. Um, and by day, I'm a manager in the Department of Orthopedics at Emory, so I've been in Emory School of Medicine uh, full-time for 10 years. All right. So thank you guys for joining us today. Uh, I'm, I'm hoping this is going to be an insightful chat for our viewers. And we're going to go ahead and kick it off. Uh, qu first question is for you, Peter. Mm -hmm. um, every MBA program addresses leadership in some way. Right. What makes Goizueta's approach to leadership development different? Um, I don't think it's any one thing, Nicole. I think it's more the system. Um, most schools have an aspect of leadership development, um, and uh, I, I'm respectful of all those activities. What we've tried to do is put together the most comprehensive program we can. And so it's the combination of faculty, and we have a really strong faculty in leadership, which is surprisingly unusual in business schools. Uh, leadership is not an area of academic scholarship research um, in, in the business school world. So most schools uh, have some type of adjunct or lecturer doing their leadership work. Here we have um, three faculty members, I'm one of them, who uh, also publish but um, also teach all the courses and have strong backgrounds in leadership. Our most senior member, Rick Yilke, is very well known um, internationally. Um, then we have uh, curricular courses in all of the MBA formats as well as co-curricular activities. And the addition of retired General Ken Keene as our Associate Dean for Leadership Development kind of really coalesced all of our leadership activities. So it's very strong right now. Well, terrific. Um, so can you talk a little bit also about how we help students um, improve their leadership effectiveness? We have um, so many different students in very different situations. You just heard Will talk about uh, he's uh, active in the military, obviously has had a lot of leadership experience already and is still growing as a leader. Ashley has been working in Emory Healthcare for 10 years as a manager, it leads others, um, and she's also uh, very active in the leadership development world. So the goal, I think, uh, to give you an example, and they'll talk more about this in a minute, um, we try to help each student uh, to achieve the leadership effectiveness that they wish to achieve. W there's no one size fits all. Um, each person has kind of their own aspirations career desires, professional activities, uh, the challenges they're currently facing. And so what we try to do is even though we have class sizes of 50 or 60, we're trying to make sure that each student uh, has a leadership development plan and can you know, kind of customize, if you will, the experience for their own needs. And so in that regard, uh, we spend a lot of time working with um, students in coaching relationships and peer coaching. Um, we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Um, and making sure that everybody has a good idea of what they're currently strong at and where the areas are for development. So you mentioned peer coaching, peer feedback. I know that's an important component of our program um, and you know, specifically built into our um, Delta Airlines Leadership Coaching Fellows Program. Right. Can you talk a little bit more about what that program entails and um, how students participate and are engaged with that program? Sure. Let me take a step back and uh, we realize that um, the experience students have in study teams is the most important kind of behavioral element uh, that they can work on while they're students here. Um, 
<clears throat> so in that regard, we put a lot of effort into improving and enhancing the teaming skills of our students. We think that's important at every level, uh, whether you're undergraduate all the way through all the MBA formats and the executive MBA. Um, some are team members, some are team leaders. And a part of that is uh, the ability of the team to be accountable to itself, to give each other feedback, to be candid with each other, and to uh, encourage optimal team performance. So with that as our kind of primary theme, we developed a few years ago the Leadership Coaching Fellows Program, both Will and Ashley are a part of that, where our um, second year students uh, are trained to be coaches of the first year students in their study teams. And we want to use that experience to one, make sure the teams are doing the best they can because that's important to their work here as uh, students. But more importantly, to learn the lessons of how to be a very effective team member and team leader going forward. So that program, which is now sponsored by Delta Airlines, has been in place now four years and has grown each year. And it's really a marvelous experience for the coaches and for the students being coached. So Ashley, you um, were originally being coached. Now you are one of these coaches. I'd love to hear your perspective um, coming in as someone who's being coached and then now as someone who's able to give that feedback to um, the, the younger uh, evening students that are coming in after you. Yeah, absolutely. So I actually um, participated in the program um, a couple years back. So um, I'm in my final year. and. Um, at the time that I actually became a coach, I also became a first-time manager. And so even though it's not a program in um, how to be a manager, it was incredibly helpful to me as, as a first-time manager to apply some of the principles that we learned in the program. Um, I think one of the, the most valuable pieces of the program is just, just this feedback piece that we're talking about. I mean, communication is so key um, in any kind of leadership as well as self-awareness. Um, and I think the peer feedback, um, particularly from the perspective of um, knowing what your blind spots are and also maybe hidden areas of strength um, really helped uh, the students that I coached. I saw them use that feedback, um, go back to their group and get more work done because they were more aware of what was going on. Terrific. And Will, um, you've been to the program. What's your take on it? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it was a unique opportunity that Emory offered that was kind of the point of differentiation from other MBAs in that you had this leadership coaching fellowship. Um, from my perspective, um, being an army officer, you're always in a position of authority or a position of leadership. And so going through Professor Topping's class, you kind of start to do some self-discovery and do, um, you know, the focus of his course is really on emotional intelligence and trying to figure out where you stand and where your, you know, weaknesses as a leader. And one of mine was essentially, um, you know, having perspective, being a better listener and uh, giving and receiving feedback. And so I saw LCF as like a great opportunity for me to be a better listener, deliver that feedback, um, and not being in a position of authority and being with your peers, you kind of are, are forced to really learn valuable lessons from your peers and really be that, that true listener um, that you really want to be, that you kind of struggle with in other, other venues of, of work. So. I thought LCF really gave me an opportunity to explore that and then just kind of take it to the next step is I just came off of the Guzueta Advanced Leadership Academy where we were sailing down in the Virgin Islands and um, General Keene as well as uh, J.B. Kirsch, we see that as he, he kind of describes it as a leadership laboratory and I think there's some truth to that in you get this opportunity for self-discovery and you get to use some tools that you may not necessarily use in a work environment because it's your peers and there's no repercussions for trying a new leadership style or pushing traits that you might necessarily uh, do otherwise. So I think both of those programs have been invaluable and have taught me leadership lessons um, that I wouldn't have otherwise done if I wasn't in this program. So one of the things that's important, if I may pick up Please. on that, Nicole, is uh, giving and receiving feedback. Um, in all the work I do in consulting and coaching outside of the school, um, that, that is almost always the number one issue at organizations. Uh, you ask subordinates how they're doing. I wish I got more feedback, more constructive feedback, or there are folks who aren't listening anymore. I can't get someone to do what I need them to do. They're closed-minded to my feedback. And <clears throat> so we spend a lot of time on the feedback side, as Will and Ashley both mentioned. Uh, and you know, three-quarters of giving good feedback is self-awareness. Uh, because you bring your own perspective and bias into that conversation. And if you're not aware of that, then you're not as effective in giving the feedback, um, certainly hearing the feedback from others along the way. So 
very glad to hear, Will, that that was a part of your experience. So we had a question that, that came in, and I'm sure that one, if not both of you, could provide some insight into this. Um, for MBA students with an introverted personality, how do you help them become leaders or take them out of their shell? So, Ashley, I want to kick this one to you as someone who's, who who's done, <laughs> well, I wasn't going to say that, but I was going to say you, you know, you've done a lot of coaching um, of, your, of your classmates. I'm sure you've seen some of this. I'd love to, to get your perspective on that. Sure. I, you know, introverts are just as much leaders as, as extroverts are. It has nothing to do with whether you're an introvert or extrovert. So I think, you know, in terms of, um, you know, bringing people into a conversation, um, I, I think as an introvert, well, and there's also introvert and being shy as well, so that's kind of a distinction to make as well. But um, for, for people, particularly like let's say in the group, um, who aren't as vocal and you want to get them to participate more, um, there are a few different approaches you can take. So one that we've tried is kind of a round robin approach where you kind of get everybody to give feedback or input into whatever the question is at, at the time. And so that's one of the approaches that I took as a leadership coaching fellow and as I, that I do as a manager as well. Um, one thing that's important is you know knowing whether your team members disagree or not and so um, another thing I've tried is if if I suggest an approach and you know I'm getting a lot of head nods I'll look around the room and say does anybody disagree and just kind of look at people individually and if you pick you know if you pick up on somebody um, who looks like maybe they have a different approach then then you can um, kind of say well I'd love to hear your opinion it's more about um, helping people know that their um, their opinion is valued and appreciated than it is kind of calling them out and saying, well, I haven't heard from you, which sort of signals that they're doing something wrong, if that makes sense. Yeah, Does that yeah. answer the question? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> I think so. Um, Will, do you have a... Well, I would just say um, what's interesting about that is that, um, especially in the MBA um, experience that you find, especially through LCF and both, uh, as well as Gala, is that I'm the opposite. Some of the leadership traits that I want to work is how to be more patient, how to be more methodical, how to hear the room out and not be... Um, you know, for say the loudest person in the room, and on the you know this past week in in Gala, my colleagues, one of their biggest goals was exactly what she was talking about: is um, trying to be that voice that was heard, or trying to be someone that's contributing, but also playing to what their strengths are and their personality. So, um, what we found was a really good technique was to challenge each other and to really tease out when they saw weakness or strength. Um, so four of my five uh, team members were probably introverted and they were pretty quiet. Um, so instead of playing the norm when we allow them to, to essentially uh, internalize their, their thoughts or internalize what they were doing, we challenged each other daily to, hey, what do you really think here? What, would, what decision should we be making? Um, and I thought that was really helpful. And to the opposite part, um, when I started to show strong personality traits or try and push into the conversation, um, one of my colleagues would say, hey, Will, have you given everyone an opportunity to think through this? And so um, it kind of plays back and, back and forth. And there's no right or wrong, but oftentimes in the corporate in environment, whoever's the loudest or whoever has the strongest personality kind of wins the match, and that's not necessarily the case. Some of the best leaders, I think, um, demonstrate the qualities of being receptive, being quiet, being methodical, thinking through what they actually want to articulate. And when they do articulate something, it's well put together and it's, it's thoughtful mm -hmm. and everyone contributes. So, What we try to talk about in the classroom is the need for leaders to balance inquiry and advocacy. The inquiry part of seeking first to understand, to um, asking good questions, to being observant. Um, to listening, as we talk about it, with three ears. Uh, what the person's saying, what the person isn't saying, and what you think the person wants to say but somehow doesn't feel like they can say. So you have to put a lot of effort into active listening, as Wilters talked about, um, to use empathy to try to understand where people are coming from and their perspective. And then you do need to advocate. At some point, you need to be persuasive, inspirational, motivational as a leader. And I think uh, any student is going to be stronger on one side of that equation than the other. And our goal is to uh, help them leverage the strength, but also to balance that strength by bringing up the other side. So as Will indicated, he needs to work a little more on the inquiry side. And as Ashley indicated, some students need to work a little more on the advocacy side. And we'll help both uh, on both parts of that equation. The more balanced you can be, the more effective you are as a leader. So we've been talking a lot about peer feedback, and we've gotten some online, and it's that Peter and Ashley need to talk a little bit louder. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, I'm sorry, I won't do that. <laughs> Um, so, Will, you touched on the gala experience and something you just came back from. Um, before I have you talk about, you know, the ins and outs of that, I'd love for Pierre just to give an overview of what gala is. It's our Griswetta Advanced Leadership Academy. Correct. Uh, and we have an evening MBA Leadership Academy as well. So these are opportunities for those students who wish to do a deeper dive into the kind of leadership development arena. Um, there's, <coughs> it's extra work, if you will, so they have to really want to do it, and Will was one of those who did. Um, and we put uh, some faculty and staff resources into it to help the students do that. For the full-time students, and Will will talk more about this, uh, the capstone event is that sailing experience in the British Virgin Islands where they're on a sailboat. You have to work as a team. Of course, there is uh, a skilled captain on the boat with them uh, from the organization that we work with, but it's much more about the teamwork and each student rotates taking a turn as the leader for that uh, particular uh, session. On the evening side, uh, since there are full-time students as well as working full-time, um, the experience is more one-on-one -on -one coaching and uh, additional workshops to help them with their current kind of management responsibilities uh, and leadership roles. So we spend a lot of time working individually with the students there with assessment instruments and coaching to give them the deeper dive. So those are students really interested in that topic and want to put the extra effort in to uh, explore their leadership development in more detail. So, Will, you were on a boat in the British Virgin Islands. That sounds pretty great. <laughs> yes, so uh, this was a hard sell to my wife when I said that I was going to do a leadership trip in the British Virgin Islands for a week, and uh, they said that it was going to be rigorous and hard, so she didn't really believe me at first. Um, but I'll tell you, I think just building blocks across my years in MBA, starting with Professor Topping's class and like really getting a good understanding of emotional intelligence and then pursuing a leadership coaching fellowship and understanding the value of debriefs and um, you know, ex encouraging everyone to participate in uh, making the team environment better, it built upon going into, uh, into gala. And so you're put onto a team that's really not necessarily uh, people that you would normally work with you get onto a boat and no one sailed before and you're being asked to do some really stressful things. And I will also tell you that I've gone through, so I've been in the Army for 10 years and been through a lot of leadership schools, one of which was uh, U.S. Army Ranger School. And I thought that this was a very enriching uh, experience in that. Um, and I joke with my Army colleagues after this, I, I had a dinner with one last night and I said, the difference was you got to really evaluate your leadership potential and there was no repercussions for failing or not doing so successful mm -hmm. so you could truly try things out and there was no repercussions if you know if your team didn't win the challenge for the day nobody was starting back over no one was failing you got to learn from each other which i thought was a was a great opportunity um, with that the challenges could be any number of things but a, like a good example would be hey, sail from point A to point B 20 miles and compete against another boat and try and figure out how you do that. Um, it's stressful and you start to really tease out some, some weaknesses and strengths amongst the team. Um, and so a great example was when we would debrief, we found that people, just like in the corporate environment, they would have an issue with some kind of leadership trait and they would just internalize it and as opposed to address it directly and try and correct the problem before it goes further. And it starts to exacerbate as it goes on. Um, so we kind of corrected this and as, as our team went on, when there was an issue, we addressed it quickly and we tried to correct the course and go forward and created this sense of um, collaborative team environment that I don't think I could have replicated anywhere else. Um, and by the end of the week, five strangers were of, I would say, from my opinion, maybe General Keene and someone else in the boat may argue different. I thought we were a high, highly functioning team and we had accomplished what we had set out to do that you wouldn't have gotten any other opportunity in an MBA program or any other corporate environment otherwise. So, Yeah, it sounds like a phenomenal learning experience, having that safe space to try things and fail. Mm -hmm. And you have two observers there. So, you know, Lieutenant General Keene's there and uh, we had... Professor Kirsch, and so, you know, they're just kind of taking notes and giving you that feedback mm -hmm. that you wish your last boss would have given you to correct your course. Um, because it's easy to tell you you're doing something really well. It's hard to say, hey, you know, when you made this decision, what do you think other people thought about that? Right. Um, which I value because that's how you can actually change the course in your leadership, uh, leadership potential, so. Sure. 
So the Leadership Academy, as Peter mentioned, is very different for our evening MBA students. Um, Ashley, you took part in our evening MBA Leadership Academy. Talk about your experiences with that. Well, it was it was a phenomenal experience. It's um, as Professor Topping mentioned, it is on you know the weekend. We're we're working full time and in school, so it's on top of all of that. Um, so it is highly motivated individuals who are in the group, which makes for a really good discussion because people really want to be there and really want to learn. Um, it's multi component, so there's some classroom teaching, there's group discussion, there's executive coaching, there's guest lecture, uh, personality profiling and testing. Um, so I would say. Um, you know, the, the key kind of term that comes to mind when I think about it is emotional intelligence. Um, students who go through that academy have already been through leadership development, which is a requirement um, in, at, in the evening program. So, you know, you learn things about how to influence and how to be a high potential, but this really takes it to that next level where you're learning more about yourself um, through tests about your conflict management style, your learning style. Um, and I, I just can't stress enough the importance of self-awareness as a leader. I mean, that is very tied with emotional intelligence, and so that's what we um, learn, as well as getting to discuss um, situations that we have in our own uh, work environments at the time and getting peer feedback on that. Uh, like I said, guest speakers, that was a really helpful part of that, um, as well as executive coaching, where you can kind of dive more deeply into what you have going on in your personal um, work life or or whatever situation that you have going on where you feel like you need individual coaching. It's a, a phenomenal service that would cost you know, a lot outside of the business school, so it's something that um, students definitely want to take advantage of and get you know, really good results out of, at least in my experience. Ashley, as a working professional, how have you taken what you've learned about yourself, your own leadership style, or how to give feedback to others and employed that on the job? Sure, I, well I did a lot of, <laughs> of, of using that on the job. Um, the first thing that comes to mind just in terms of feedback was um, is performance reviews. So um, we, we know that from what we've learned in, in, uh, in our various leadership programs that, that feedback sh is a gift and should be given um, on a regular basis, not just in an annual performance review or God forbid people that don't even do that. Um, so you know, one of the things I've done is try to give continual feedback. Uh, we learned that you know the, the proper ratio is about five to one, which is very very difficult to do, and by that I mean five positive to one negative. Um, when you're when you're doing that, you're not only kind of meeting the um, you know balance um, positive to negative, but you're exceeding that to where when that person that you're managing hears that feedback, they understand where you're coming from and that they're good they're doing a good job and they take that better. Um, so continual feedback is one. I incorporated some of the peer reviews into my performance review process because I found comparing one's own scores with one's peer scores to be an incredibly helpful metric. Um, and then also some of the lessons from the uh, Leadership Coaching Fellows Program where we uh, learned to know our team personally. I um, took all of my staff out to you know, coffee meetings just to get to know them and who they were and how I could help them get to where they were going. Um, and yeah, I think um, the other thing would just be the importance of setting expectations and debriefing which is, like Will was saying, it's something that you get to do in a safe space when you're in the, the school where you have a team and it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to you know, get really um, open and honest feedback um, so that you practice those frameworks, you learn how to set expectations on the front end so that you know how you want to deal with conflict when it arises, for example, and then as you go through and when you end up on a project, you can debrief, say, what did we do well, what, we, what can we do better next time? Um, in a safe environment where you can practice that, and then in the work environment, you're you're a little more comfortable with that, where where it really matters and where those results are much more critical. Awesome, thank you. So we've talked about the the leadership coaching fellows program. We've talked about um, the leadership academy. Another component mm -hmm. of our leadership development that we offer to students um, is the leaders reaction course. Um, this is a pretty unique opportunity. Um, so if you could give an overview of that, and then I'm going to let these guys who have been through it mm -hmm. um, give their uh, impression and feedback. Sure. Um, I, I've been involved with uh, kind of leadership development in business schools for a good while now. And um, there were outdoor learning experiences, we call them low ropes, that we would uh, use with students or uh, folks in executive education programs where you put people into team problem solving situations, very action oriented. 
Um, so it, this is not a new concept, but the, of course the military and the army particularly has, uh, has used it for such a long time and um, does it at such a high level. That we were just very fortunate that our Associate Dean Ken Keene has access to this. He was uh, commander of the Fort Benning <coughs> facility for the Army for many years. And so he has been able to help us get access to the Leader Reaction Course, which is their version of kind of leadership development training um, in action learning for officers in the military. And so we are able to take groups of students there and go through uh, a series of team challenges. Each has a coach, someone uh, in our network who's been through the program, will, will be one, um, Ashley as well, uh, who will give the team some feedback, um, but also basically to observe and help the team to um, understand what they're learning from those experiences and to see the students go through these challenges um, and develop their communication and their teamwork skills as they go through it is really quite extraordinary. So. It's um, one of those co-curricular activities that is, a, I think, a highlight for almost any student group we've taken there. Well, as someone who's in the military, I'm curious what your impression of this program or course is. Yeah, so I was a little skeptical because I'd done it probably four or five times throughout my military career. Um, but I was, I was open-minded to it in that um, it was a great opportunity. One of the things I think is really big in terms of my leadership um, um, profile is that I always like to build a sense of community and I thought that this would be a great opportunity for my core team to kind of go through some stress together and build that sense of community. Um, what I found was it was very different than the experiences I had had in the past in that in the military you have people that are very type A, um, very you know go-getter and not very slow and methodical in how they think through and business students are probably 180 of that they're very risk adverse, um, they think things through, and when it, when it comes to execution, their plan is more important than anything else. And so it was really um, an exciting time to do that with my core team, to see everyone's different ways of how they think things through, how they execute, and how, um, how they can lead. And so I thought for a majority of my team, they walked away with some really good notes on hey, what do I do in a stressful situation? How can I think things through? How can I make sure that everyone's on the same sheet of music? How can I communicate that properly? And how can we get through this challenge in the kind of limited time that we have together? Um, and it just, you can't replicate the stress that you can do in that 20 minute challenge. And the amount of debrief you get out of that 20 minutes may be in excess of an hour in some cases. Um, so I thought it was, Although it was completely different of anything I had done, it was awesome to do that with uh, my colleagues here at the school in that we built a sense of community, we got to see each other's strengths and weaknesses in action, um, and we got to learn from each other on how we execute and how we plan in kind of a very short tempo. So I would recommend, I would recommend it for anybody if you get the opportunity. Ashley, how about you? What, what do you think of the, the, the program, um, actually going through it at the time, and then what you learn from the experience? Oh my gosh, so I, you know, s similarly, I wouldn't say I was skeptical, but I was a little afraid to do it. <laughs> it's just not something that I, that I would normally participate in, but I knew it was gonna be a good experience, and, I'm s and I knew I'd be glad I did, and I am so glad I did. Um, I mean, one thing I'll note is just that, the, again, you know, on the theme of people wanting to be there, the coaches that are there and the leaders are so just, they want to be there. They're so happy to provide advice and give um, direction, and they're just such wonderful people. And so, you know, that was for me a very meaningful part of it. Um, but there are a lot of uh, pieces of that program that translate into real life. That you, it may not hit you in the moment when you're trying to figure out how to put this log on that, you know, whatever ledge, and you know, trying to figure out the problem at hand. But it's very hands-on. Um, but as far as you know how that translates some of the, the key learnings you know again with communication is key making sure that people know what the plan is um, that they're okay with the plan but also not spending too much time thinking about that as in terms of um, you know you have to act at some point as well um, and that's true in real life as well as sometimes you just have to you have to just dive in if there's an urgent issue going on um, and uh, yeah, it's just, there were just so many um, kind of overlaps with, with real life and just like the, um, the leader, leadership coaching fellows program, it was really helpful to have a safe place to kind of learn those lessons and then go back to kind of real life and, and implement those. 
Sure. So each student has an opportunity to kind of lead their team through one of the challenges, sometimes multiple opportunities, depending on how many challenges they get through. And the external coach, um, observer, um, then gives feedback, written feedback, to each student. So they take that away with them for the time that they were in the leadership role. And wh what you see is pretty much what you all described so nicely. Uh, sometimes the leader decides, I have to take charge. Uh, we have to create a plan, and I need to lead from the front. And that might not be the best choice in that particular challenge. Leading from the rear might be uh, a better solution for that particular situation. So one of the things we try to work on with our students, and this is done under duress, limited time, difficult challenge, sometimes difficult weather conditions as well. Fort Benning in July is a lot of fun, as you can imagine. Um, <clears throat> so y you have to be able to work under those kinds of conditions. And we want them to be able to diagnose the situation quickly. And no matter what work situation you're going into, it needs um, the importance for a leader of to understand what's going on in the business, in the organization, on my team, and with them as an individual, their own kind of uh, response to the situation. And put those pieces together, and then to understand their followers well enough to know how, what's the best approach to leading this group of people through this situation, and still be me, be authentic. Because I won't trust you if I don't think you're authentic and genuine. And without trust, you can manage me, but you're unlikely to be able to lead me. So to be able to do that in such uh, difficult and condensed um, situations adds to the work we do in the classroom, where we have more time to talk about um, diagnosis, business diagnosis, organizational diagnosis. What kind of alternatives do we have? What approach might work here? How do you adapt your leadership practices to meet the needs of this situation and the group of people that you're leading? So all of this ties in very nicely together with coursework and these uh, co-curricular activities. You know, I would just say to follow up on that, like placement of leader and communication were really important in that exercise. Mm -hmm. And when you reflect back on some of the best and worst leaders that you've had in your professional career, you can correlate some of the experiences that you had in the leadership reaction course in that, you know, maybe the best boss that you ever had was one that could quickly assess the situation, put himself in a position where everyone could access him or, or her, or they could um, easily see out everyone that's there and communicate and leverage the strengths and weaknesses of the team. And when you had failures, maybe on the leadership reaction course, some of the same issues that were there were the same issues you may have had with maybe not a high performing boss. They may have not put themselves in the best situation. They may not communicate efficiently. They may not thoroughly see through the plan. Um, and they may not take on onus for failure or success of the team. So it is, as small of a challenge as that is, and as 20 minutes goes by pretty quickly, you have a lot of time to think back, what was, what was it that I really enjoyed from bosses in my professional um, career, and how do I correlate that to this challenge that I had, and what can I learn from that going forward? So a lot of these are team-based activities. Mm -hmm. as happens in business school, as happens in life. Um, what question came in, how do faculty create groups um, based on personalities or abilities, strengths, weaknesses, um, to prevent group think? Um, <coughs> the, the study teams, the core teams, uh, are uh, constructed uh, by the school, by the program office, uh, not by the students. And they are purposefully diverse, diverse demographically, and as much psychographically as we possibly can. Um, you know, a third of our students are from outside the U.S., and so each study team is going to have an international student or students in the group. Uh, we divide up by their work experience, their uh, educational experience, uh, gender, age, etc. And so uh, the goal is to see how that group of people can coalesce quickly and make sure, as we talked about earlier, and as Ashley was discussing the introvert issue, you know, uh, our international students, uh, English is not their native language. Uh, we move fast here in our language. Uh, we assume everybody can keep pace, and that's not always the case. So how do we make sure that we're taking full uh, advantage of the wisdom that they have with our study teams? So there's a, a, a science and an art to it that we use. Um, and then, of course, we try to help the students to learn how do you bring out the full potential in every member of a team. 
because we want every student graduating from the programs to be able to be effective, either they're a team member or a team leader, in making sure that the team takes full advantage of everybody's talent. And I think if you think about it in the work world, that, that is rarely the case. We're leaving something, we're holding something back. We're not giving our full, our all to the, to the challenge. And you've got to wonder the, the factors that contribute to why people don't um, realize their full potential. And that's what we're trying to help our students to appreciate. Terrific. Um, so uh, another component of our leadership development is leaders in residence. Can you touch on what those are um, and, sure. and how they engage with students? Uh, I think Will and Ashley are being kind because they haven't mentioned that they get tired of hearing the faculty preach. So we like to bring in folks from the real world and they may give the same message, but the students love it because it's coming from the real world. Uh, that's a little cynical or uh, facetious, I would add. It's very good to get other opinions in here. There's no one right answer to leadership. Uh, and even with the group of us who, who work on it uh, from the faculty and staff side here, very important to gain outside perspectives as well. One of the advantages to being in a business school is that you have the opportunity to participate in um, the guest speakers that come through, and um, we've already talked about uh, some of the impact of that. And so we formalize that program a bit in that we have identified a group of um, uh, both corporate, nonprofit, and uh, other leaders who are willing to not just come in for a, a guest lecture, uh, but to be available to us over the course of a year or so, to come in and out of the school interacting with uh, classes, with small groups of students, with faculty, um, and even one-on-one, -on -one in sharing some of their lessons learned and wisdom along the way. And we have that from the kind of the leader side and as well as the entrepreneur side, folks who have created businesses uh, who are willing to share those experiences with our students. So we try to integrate them as best we can into the full range of our programs. Right now, for example, there will be uh, um, a leadership development course for the evening students coming up in May, and several of them will be a part of that course delivery uh, in my course. Either of you like to jump in and share how you've utilized the leaders in residence? I would say that it's, it's, uh, it's largely beneficial to have um, people from both uh, the corporate sector as well as uh, retired military officers leveraging General Keene's context to bring in uh, retired general officers um, who talk about basic leadership principles. They don't really go into, you know, large abstract details. It's usually those that have been successful in both corporate uh, world and, and in the military kind of held two or three key values and held them near and dear to their leadership philosophy. and. Um, it's really it's exciting to hear um, how those people stayed true to that over a 30 or 40 year span of, of their success. Um, I, I was always excited to get a guest speaker in any one of the classes or even through leadership coaching fellows, uh, hearing people come in and just discuss uh, the same challenges. And, 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 and it is, it's, uh, it's good to hear um, someone that's been in for 35 years of doing corporate world that they still struggle with the same things that I struggle with. Uh, being a professional in the world for only 10 years. You know, everyone struggles giving feedback. Everyone struggles with conflict. Everyone struggles with building a team that trusts each other. Um, and they just have a unique talent of leveraging some skills to, to make the best of those situations. And so it's good to just kind of journal that. General Keene talks about it, and uh, Professor Topping does as well, is that you know, if I can look back at my journal over the past year of all these key lessons that I have, it's no more than four or five pages, but if you look through those, they're really great points on things that I want to work on um, when I leave Guzwada and go back into, uh, into my professional life. Yeah, one of the huge advantages to being in the evening MBA program is that you're here for a while. So, um, so I've had the pleasure of um, hearing one of our uh, leadership uh, leaders in residence, uh, Elve Kweko, um, I think probably five times now. Um, so, you know, just phenomenal experience. He's the former president of Michelin, and so he, you know, can tell you a lot about both his experience, but also um, as a leader how he grew and um, just kind of enriches you culturally because he's from another country. And um, I, there are periodically opportunities um, that we receive over email to meet with other leaders and residents. So people from different sectors, whether it's nonprofit, higher ed, you know, whatever your finance, you know, whatever your industry is, um, you're able to kind of meet with other 
um, leaders as well. And so, you know, I've met with a few others, and it's yeah, just an incredible opportunity to hear from people in the real world. Um, you know how they've used these principles, and exactly what Will was saying that they that we all have the same challenges. Thank you. Um, so we have had uh, another question come in from someone in the audience, um, and they are wondering what you think are the top three qualities a leader should have. I think it might be a little tough to nail down three qualities, <laughs> but I think more generally speaking, um, I, you know, you guys talked a lot about giving and receiving feedback. You talked about emotional intelligence. Um, Peter, if you want to just start by just touching on what, what are the types of um, skills and competencies, I would say, that we're trying to instill sure. in students to create leaders? It's hard to <laughs> narrow it down to three. <laughs> we'll try. Uh, on my list, number one is integrity. Uh, that um, <coughs> you have a set of principles, uh, of values that guide your decisions, that you're consistent in those in all different types of situations, um, and that you're looking at the benefits uh, for the others uh, more than you are for yourself. A bit of humility goes with that as well. Um, so I'm not sure if that's two or one. Um, emotional intelligence is very important. Uh, we believe that you know, there are many ways to look at leadership. That's one that is um, consistent across cultures, levels, etc. And so part of that is the, the knowledge of self uh, as well as your ability to de demonstrate empathy and to build relationships with diverse groups of people. So I put those two. And uh, in the organizational world, depending on uh, what type of organization you're in, you have to be able to deliver results. So part of this is how do you mobilize folks in order to achieve the organizational goals. So that would be my top three. You guys have any, anything else you'd like to add? I would just say, I think from this past year, just even last week, I realized that a sense of community is really important. Um, so building a team that everyone knows each other and everyone kind of leans on each other, I think some of the best community you can have is when you've all gone through a stressful situation together. Um, you, when you build that sense of trust and that sense of bond, which gets me to my second point, which is trust. Um, a trusting team is one that is you know, I will do whatever it takes to finish the, the job at hand because I trust that I um, will do my part and someone else will do their part. So the sense of community and trust, um, and then that kind of falls back to a sense of respect for everyone and, and knowing everyone's strengths and weaknesses and having enough respect to give them um, that candid feedback or that, uh, that, you know, hey, that a boy when they need it and knowing each other. So. That's probably what I've learned this year, more so than anything else. You can have rigor and you can try and push a team as hard as they can, but if you don't have that sense of community, you don't trust each other, um, and you don't respect each other, you're never really going to be a high-performing team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, all of the above. <laughs> um, excellent points. That, to me, everything um, in terms of leadership that I've learned throughout the program comes down to being a servant leader. Um, it's not, when you're a leader, it's not about you. It's about the people you're leading. Um, leadership is not a privilege, it is a responsibility. Um, and when you have that frame of reference, everything kind of falls from there. You are a better listener, you're more emotionally intelligent because you're realizing it's not all about you, for example. So that's, for me, that's kind of the core of where all of these things kind of cascade from. How do you think you've developed your, your own authentic leadership style um, as from the point you came into the program to now? Um, for me, um, so it, this is, you probably can tell by how excited I am about this stuff. It's, I think about it a lot. Um, it's something that I've, um, I would say is a multi-component approach. Um, the business school has been incredibly phenomenal um, in terms of just the variety of offerings um, throughout the program. It's not just a one class and you're done. It's there are offerings throughout the entire time. Um, you know, in addition to that, just kind of reading a lot. I think the you know can't stress the importance enough of, of reading as a leader as well, um, and keeping up to speed with some of the kind of current thought leaders and in the industry, um, and just uh, putting the practices um, uh, into uh, into practice with my own team at work. Um, I think is really important in terms of a learning style because you're able to see what you're learning and how that translates into real life, um, real time, which it doesn't have to be, you don't have to have direct reports to be a leader or to put this stuff into practice. Leadership is about caring for other people, so it could be anybody. It could be a colleague or you know, whoever, uh, your team at, at Goy Sweater if you're, if you're full time. 
Um, so I think, yeah, practicing, reading, um, you know, just learning, continual learning. Yeah. And I would say the Leadership Coaching Fellowship um, has helped me evolve as a leader in that um, my previous job, I probably helped my subordinates a little too much to answer questions. Um, hey, here's a problem, and I didn't give them the opportunity to really seek out the solution on their own terms. Um, I mean, you know, kind of circling back to Professor Topping's class when you go through the emotional intelligence, having that self-awareness to know that, hey, I may be too quick to try and solve things for my subordinates, and I'm not giving them an opportunity, A, to be the leader that they deserve to be, or really have that sense of uh, pride that they can, they can solve it. So in, in LCF, you really get that opportunity to listen and kind of tease out um, solutions on people's own terms. So instead of you, you can hear a group going through some stress and instead of saying hey you guys probably should just stop this whole discussion what you really need is to standardize communication and move forward but instead you have to kind of journal things out okay how do i help them solve this on their own terms and asking leading questions without really giving them the answer and then they have that own their own self-discovery um, which i want to take forward this next year and give my subordinates some better opportunity to solve their own problems and go through their own thought and development to get to a solution. So that certainly has evolved how I want to be a leader. And I think LCF definitely builds those skills as much as you don't want to and as hard as it can be to be in a room when you know the solution. And, um, but it's not your job to find the solution. It's your job to, to enable people to find their own solution and be the leader that helps them, that gives them the tools to find their own answers. So. Is there anything that you guys learn about yourselves or as a leader or just, you know, as, as a, a professional um, through the program, through any of the leadership development programs or any of the other aspects of the MBA program? Absolutely. I mean, I mean you're, you're continually learning. And, you know, like I said, with the, particularly with the, the, um, <coughs> the evening uh, academy, leadership academy, which, of course, is offered, you know, for full time as well, um, we do a lot of kind of introspective um, uh, work and to, to understand ourselves better um, but I think y you're always learning in every class about you know what approach you um, might take that your classmate might we have a very collaborative and discussion based approach at Goizueta and so you're learning a lot if not as much from your peers as you are from um, from your professors and and the readings so so you get to know um, not only yourself, but how you differ from others, which is really helpful when you go back to the workforce because then you can take those learnings and say, wow, I would never have approached it that way. Or, or, or you know, uh, this person, you know, geez, they prefer to meet at a different location. I would have never thought about that. That's one, one lesson I learned as a coach is, is just to be open-minded about kind of everything. People, um, leadership, um, you know, to your point, is about kind of being able to um, mold to what the person that you're leading kind of needs at that time mm -hmm. and or n if you're if you're managing kind of up as well you, know, you need to know how your um, superiors um, need to be approached so yeah I constantly learning mm -hmm. yeah well yeah I would say I had a lot of uh, self-reflection in the first couple months of of the MBA program going from a very rigorous assignment prior to this and being in a high uh, op tempo environment where um, speed is sometimes success um, so being around a bunch of my peers and colleagues who think about things in a different manner and need more time and it was really frustrating for me I thought why are we wasting so much time and probably by month three I realized it's, it, 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 slow is okay slow is okay it's all right to dissect the problem and in some instances, it's better to be slow and really think things out and have perfect execution as opposed to a hasty execution with, uh, with a poor plan. So I've certainly adapted, and I'm, I'm not any better, I don't think, um, at, at taking the, tr the time that's required sometimes. I may still be a little too hasty, but it's good to be around knowing that I need to be around people that say, hey, Will, you probably just need to slow down. Let's really think this out. Let's whiteboard it. And instead of being frustrated now, I go, hey, I really appreciate it. That's what we need. That's mm -hmm. what we have to do to, mm -hmm. to make this right. And uh, I think my core team can attest to that. And, and even last week in Gala, I think, 
it was really easy for me to slow down. In fact, you know, hey, let's just really think this out for another 10 minutes. Hey, great point. Let's do that. Where maybe nine months ago, I may have been pretty frustrated with that, you know, slow is steady um, mentality. So, I think learning to think fast and slow <laughs> at the same time is a really good skill. Yeah. So yeah. Peter, we, we focus a lot on the students and their growth as leaders, right. but um, I'm interested to hear from you, uh, what do you learn mm -hmm. as someone who's teaching the program? What are you learning? I think we're, we're constantly learning. We learn a lot from our students. We certainly have learned from both Will and Ashley, as well as others. Um, and a part of it is our own self-discovery. Uh, I was a senior administrator for 30 years before becoming full-time faculty, and so I led small teams. and had difficult situations, et cetera, and different kinds of uh, uh, types of organizations. I wish I had taken uh, some of the classes and had the LCF experience behind me. I would have been better at it. But I remember one coaching experience where I was coaching one of the leadership coaching fellows who was describing a situation in the study team where he helped them to avoid conflict. And that kind of struck a chord with me of how I used to lead. And we talked about it, and he discovered through our conversation that he was avoiding the conflict for his own benefit, that he didn't want to see the conflict in the team, so he steered the team in the direction of avoiding the conflict, which really wasn't in the best interest of the team. So that was a key learning moment for that particular leadership coaching fellow, as well as for me. And I think it's that synergy, if you will, of the students, faculty, and staff here that just adds to the overall. We, we learn each year, and we try to improve our programs each year. Um, and through that, I think we're getting better each year. That's terrific. Um, so with that, we are going to wrap up this web chat. Thank you again so much for uh, participating. Um, it adds a lot of value to hear from students in the program, and obviously our faculty teaching in the program. Thank you, everyone, um, for watching and for submitting the questions that you did. It provided a very fruitful conversation. As I mentioned before, we have recorded this entire session. I'll send it out along with the slides within about a week via email. Uh, if you have any additional questions, feel free to follow up. Um, and go to the website to learn more. Um, we have contact information on there. If you have any questions, whether it's about leadership or any other aspects of the program or the admissions process, we're, we're happy to answer those. We do have several web chats coming up in the future, um, both for full-time and evening students. I've got them up on the screen now, and I'll include them in the email that goes out as well. So feel free to register for those and submit questions for those as well. Thank you very much.